Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this service of worship from St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Scarborough. It's a real pleasure to have you here today and we're thankful that you've joined in. I'd like to tell you that we have the opportunity to share this service with those who do not have internet connections by sharing it by phone and we're going to do that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So please tell your friends and neighbors who don't have internet that they can access it over the telephone. We sent a letter to you last week with all the instructions for getting onto the phone call. Um, so please refer to that letter for more information. Um, it's our desire to express our, our appreciation to the long-term care workers on the front lines in three of our homes in Scarborough. And so if you'd like to make a donation, you can do it through the third section of your envelope marked other, and just clearly mark it as long-term care home worker appreciation. Uh, we will add all the donations together so that we can make a donation uh, and give our thanks to the um, health workers who are working so hard at this time. And the last announcement is that there's an opportunity for a fun Friday evening activity over the internet platform called Zoom. It's called Name That Tune, and it's happening this coming Friday at 6.30, and it will take about 45 minutes to an hour. If you'd like to join, please call Joanna in the office on Monday morning to sign up, and she can give you some more details about that. And now let us take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 55 selected verses. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, bringing it forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that purpose which, for which I purpose it and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Our opening hymn this morning is sung for us by the praise team at St. Andrews, and it's called Christ in Me. Great. 
your forgiveness when darkness falls, and my heart is heavy with sin. Fill me with faith for the higher cause of the ceaseless praise of the King. Oh, Spirit of God, come down. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of your great love for us, we are not consumed. Your passions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness to us. Spirit of beauty and holiness, in this time of worship, would you turn our wayward hearts towards you? We long to experience your presence, to hear you whisper our names, and to experience the warmth of your loving embrace. We come to worship you this morning with so many things on our minds, and we bring everything to you now, including our faith and our doubts, our joys and our pain. In our isolation, we reach out to you for the assurance that we're never alone, that darkness is as light to you. In our weariness, we look to you for calm and restoration. In our mourning, we long for your comfort and peace. In our hunger and thirst for righteousness, we ask you to nourish us by your word, both in our service of worship today and in our daily walk with you. And in our sinfulness, we repent and ask for the gift of your forgiveness once again. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. In what seems to be a sea of constant change, you, Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. May we learn even more of you today and of your means of grace, so that we might, day by day, become more and more your faithful disciples. Holy Spirit of God, move amongst us as a fellowship of believers. Counsel, teach, and guide us as we grow up into maturity in our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us as a church to be a beacon of light set on a hill that brings others to know Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to hear now from the word of God as it comes to us in Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Thanks be to God for his word to us. I'm sure that at some point all of us have had one or been stood against one. A door frame, a piece of kitchen wall, some place in the house that was covered in little pencil marks. Some of those pencil marks may have been quite close together, and some of them much further apart. What they are, of course, is a record of growth. Our kids' growth, if we've been parents, maybe even our own growth at one point in time. It's incredible how important that growth can be to us, especially during those times in life when we're still growing. Measure Me is a plea that you can sometimes hear almost on a daily basis. Our kids are so eager to grow and to know precisely how much and how fast they're growing that new pencil marks can sometimes appear almost overnight. And both as parents and as grandparents, our interest in the next generation's progress is rarely very far behind. Seeing our kids or our grandkids grow and just as importantly, watching them grow up yields some of the proudest moments that we might ever experience. And in that respect, God is little different. There are reasons why Jesus invites us to call God Father. And there are reasons why what we might call parental metaphors show up both in the Old Testament and in the New. And like any parent, God's hope, God's intention, God's purpose for his people is growth. But how does God measure that growth? Or how do we measure the growth that God is watching for? If the Lord actually had a kitchen wall, which is where we recorded our kids' growth, what sort of pencil marks would we find on it? You might say that numbers are one way you can measure growth. Jesus certainly talked about the rejoicing that takes place in heaven whenever even one sinner repents. So growth could be measured by counting people by measuring the size of God's growing family. And while as a congregation, we have had to say our share of goodbyes over the years, we've also had the joy of being able to count new people on a regular basis. But growth in numbers isn't the only kind of growth that God is interested in. He's also passionate about growth in faith, and in the depth of fellowship that Monica talked about last week, growth in maturity and in understanding as well. He's also concerned about growth in giving and in praying and in the use of our gifts, and it's not hard to understand why. 
Imagine for a moment that the church was a school. And I know that right now school looks very different than it did two months ago. But think back to when school wasn't the living room or the kitchen table. If the church was a school, would there be some joy, maybe even some pride in being the biggest school in the area? Sure there would. But what if it turned out that none of the kids in that school ever got out of kindergarten? That of their total enrollment, 100% of the kids were still in the primary grades. That'd take a little bit of the shine off being the biggest school in the area, wouldn't it? And that's why both individually and as a congregation, we need to know that God's purpose for us is growth. Growth in more than just numbers. Growth in what we might call discipleship. If you have any doubts about how seriously God takes that kind of growth, consider the following verses. The author of Hebrews writes, Let us go onward toward maturity, leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, the Apostle Peter wrote in his first letter, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wrote in his second. And we hear Paul saying something very similar in our passage from Ephesians this morning. In this passage, he has been talking about building up the body of Christ. That has been his focus. But as he writes, Paul also looks down the road a bit. He, he takes a glimpse of the ultimate goal, and that's something that all of us need to do at times. Paul lets himself imagine the church as God would want it to be, and then he sets out to describe it. And what he says is that the church will have achieved God's hope for it when two things happen. First of all, he says, the church will be what God intends it to be when we all come to unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Unity has been the theme of a great deal of this letter to the Ephesians. Right from the start, Paul's been talking about how God is building this new community. A community, Paul says, that for all its differences has some incredibly powerful things in common. The church is one body. Its life comes from one spirit. And as its members, we all share a single calling, a single hope. We are united, Paul says, by a common Lord, a common faith, a common baptism, and also by a common Father the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying here is that when we come to the point of recognizing those things that we have in common, all that God has given to us in Jesus, then we are halfway there to being the kind of church that God wants us to be. And yet, as important as unity is, unity alone is not enough there has to be something more. When unity alone becomes the goal, then the church actually begins to enter some potentially very dangerous waters. When unity alone becomes the goal, what you end up with is what Chuck Colson once called hot tub religion. That is, religion whose sole purpose is to make everyone feel good. Religion that focuses on what people want and soon forgets, perhaps entirely, what God wants. Today, there are even so-called churches that in pursuit of making everyone feel comfortable, they have dropped all references to God completely. And that's why Paul, for all his concern about unity, isn't willing to leave it there. Unity alone cannot be the target. It cannot be the resting place. And so Paul goes on to describe the other goal 
that God has for the church. And that, Paul says, is maturity. Maturity for each believer. Maturity as well as unity is God's goal for the church. Now, all of that raises the crucial question about what Christian maturity looks like. After all, maturity is a word that's become somewhat flexible in its meaning over the years. It used to mean uh, someone who acted in a way that was appropriate to or even perhaps beyond his or her years. But more recently, it's begun to be used in different ways. And as the kids of the baby boom have begun entering their retirement years, advertising agencies have latched onto this word mature like a kind of refrain. You're not getting older, they'll tell you. You're just getting mature. The other problem with defining maturity is that the kind of maturity that Paul is talking about isn't your everyday kind of maturity. It's spiritual maturity. And that kind of maturity doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, the, with age. For instance, in 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy not to let anyone despise him because of his youth, but to continue to set an example for the believers. Even at Timothy's tender age, Paul had already recognized this spiritual maturity in him, a maturity that made him a worthy pastor of his congregation, even though many of those that he was serving may have been significantly older than he was. So if this maturity and age are not the same thing, how do we recognize it? How do we know what it is? Well, in that respect, Paul gives us two pictures to think about. First, he talks about attaining the full stature of Christ. He talks about growing up into him. Jesus is the measuring stick, Paul's saying. He is the standard, being like him, having his mind, his character. That's the goal. In Romans 8.29, Paul actually reminds us that this is why we were called. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. We must grow up into him, Paul says. Growing up spiritually so that we become more and more like Jesus. Having his faith, his priorities, his servant attitude, his passion for the lost. That is the goal that God has in mind. The second picture that Paul gives us is one that contrasts that Christ-like maturity with those who instead continue to be spiritual children. And it seems that this has always been a problem with the church, even during the age of the apostles. For instance, the author of Hebrews points out that by the time he was writing, some of his readers really ought to have been teachers of the faith. But in fact, they were still needing someone to teach them even the elementary truths of God's word. And Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, expresses a very similar concern about some of the believers there who still don't seem to be ready for the solid food that he had to give them, but instead continued to be spiritual infants. And of course, here in Ephesians, Paul says that God's goal for us is that we should no longer be mere children in the faith. And what we need to realize is that the apostles are saying this sort of thing out of concern. It's not that Paul or any of the others enjoys being critical. On the contrary, it's because Paul cares so deeply about these Christians, about these congregations that he's helped to start. He's worried about them. And that is why he writes the way that he does. Because Paul knows that those who don't mature are vulnerable. 
Now, the vulnerability of our kids is something that the news reminds us of almost on a daily basis. But what Paul is saying is that those who don't mature spiritually are vulnerable as well. They're vulnerable, for one thing, Paul says, to deception. They're vulnerable to what he calls trickery, craftiness, deceitful scheming. Essentially, what Paul is saying is that those who don't mature will always be vulnerable to those who would lie to them and consequently lead them astray. And we have seen ample evidence of that over the years. Today, we see a church that is less and less grounded in Scripture. We see all kinds of people simply making up their ethics as they go. And over and over again, especially around Easter time, it seems, we see people floating out all kinds of, of tantalizing theories and attention-grabbing stories about the origins of Christianity. They present theory as fact and make statements without evidence. But the vulnerable, both in the church and in society at large, are still left wondering whether the historical foundations of our faith are really as solid as they once thought. And that's what happens when you stay on the very surface of the faith. It becomes incredibly difficult to, to tell godly teaching from teaching that's simply framed in spiritual language. Another of the marks of maturity, therefore, is that those who are mature in the faith are able to recognize false teaching when they hear it. And similarly, similarly they're able to identify God's truth when it is presented to them. I remember once reading that in the days before plastic money and holograms and invisible counter watermarks on our currency, Treasury officials tr were trained to spot counterfeit cash simply by handling the genuine article over and over and over again. Over time, they became so familiar with the real thing that as soon as something questionable came along, they were able to pick up on it right away. And that too is God's goal for us, that we should be so familiar with his word that we can tell the true from the counterfeit right away. As Jesus points out in John's gospel, those who are his sheep know his voice. They recognize their shepherd when he speaks to them. And because they know the truth when they hear it, they're able to cling to that truth and hold to that truth in the midst of an age that sometimes denies the existence of truth altogether. God's purpose for us is maturity. He doesn't want us to be vulnerable, but rooted rooted in the truth, rooted in his word, rooted in his son, so that we can stand firm whenever the shifting winds that Paul writes about blow, rather than flying about like nothing is nailed down. But that maturity doesn't happen automatically. It's not something that we necessarily find with age alone. Instead, it comes, as Paul says here, as the saints of God are equipped, as we engage with the Bible as a congregation and personally, as we speak the truth to one another in love. The Lord is eager to see that kind of growth happen among us. He's eager to see it happen in your life and in mine. And the Lord wants us to be eager for that kind of growth, just as eager as he is, as eager to grow as our kids and grandkids are, eager to be able to look at God's kitchen wall and see how much we've grown. Amen.
Father, even as our worship continues to be shaped by our isolation, we recognize the opportunities we've been offered in a shut down or slowed down world. The opportunity to devote time to you, to the growth that we've heard about today, to spending time in your word and in prayer. Father, even as we thank you for that kind of opportunity, we recognize that many have experienced no slowdown at all. As many sit at home, others continue to work, to risk, to serve, and to fight the onslaught of this virus. And it's not just here, Lord. The numbers show us a world that is in places being overwhelmed. And we pray again this morning for those on the front lines and pray that you would show us where individually or collectively we could make a difference. Father, we pray this morning for those who are caught up in the uncertainty and, anxi and anxiety that a crisis like this can produce. Sleepless nights loneliness, even fear. Again, we pray that behind all the closed doors of our lives, Jesus would appear and speak peace into troubled hearts, just as he did for his disciples all those years ago. We continue to pray for those making decisions about the future, laying out the roadmap to reopening. Grant them your wisdom, we pray. And we pray for the kids and for the parents of kids and for the educators who in new and often very unfamiliar ways are working to ensure that our kids' development continues. May a concern for their spiritual development also be a part of what motivates them and motivates us as a church as well. Father, this virus continues to take from us and from many families, people who are dearly loved, sometimes without any real opportunity to say goodbye or, or even to get other to say goodbye in a more formal way. We know the weight of grief and pray that in those who know Jesus as the resurrection and the life, that weight would be lifted. Lord, our roadmap as a society may be unclear, but the way ahead for us in Jesus is clear, as is our destination. In that confidence, help us to face whatever the week ahead may hold. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering. This morning, I want to extend uh, thanks to all of you who have risen to the challenge of uh, ensuring that St. Andrews has the kind of financial support that we need in order to be able to continue to minister uh, during this crisis. We uh, are glad to be able to report this morning that so far we have been able to uh, match all of our expenses and so we want to say thank you to you even as we say thank you to God for his providence that allows us to continue to do his work. I invite you to join me in prayer. Lord, we read in your word that our first fruits belong to you in a very special way. And we pray that whether those first fruits are financial or the first fruits of our time or the first fruits of our attention, that they might be offered to you enthusiastically. 
and that they in turn would bear fruit as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let's offer ourselves to the Lord in our final hymn, Lord of all power. benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.